kind of river life would he have encountered? Uh, what sort of peoples would he have seen? What sort of other boating would he have seen? Okay. Flatboats coming down at paces during the peak season, uh, you, you, would, you would be hard-pressed to find a stretch of river in which other flatboats were not visible. That's how many were coming down. Steamboats coming back in the other direction. And the, the, uh, now, prior to the development of steamboats, the way you got upriver was rather awkward, and the vessel was called a keelboat. And if you picture the vessel that Lewis and Clark took up the Missouri, uh, that's a keelboat. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, more like um, almost kind of a Mesopotamian-looking canoe with multiple oarsmen, a sail, poles, and they did everything they could to go up against a current. The farthest you could get was about Natchez. And when now, all of you know Lincoln came to New Orleans, and what you might not have known is that his father came in 1806, yes. pre-steamboat. So the way he came back was uh, he probably made his way to Natchez, possibly on a keelboat, and then took the Natchez Trace back. Uh, so, uh, so the river at Lincoln's time would have had all these flatboats coming down, and then they would take a steamboat back up. And uh, by, off, by 1828, there were steamboats there, and keelboats were sure. not in uh, keel, the, the steamboat end, completely ended the keelboat mm -hmm. scene, except on tributaries that were too small and too shallow for steamboats. All these but, flatboats were coming from tributaries up right. north, yes? That's right, that's mm -hmm. right. The, 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 what was Ohio, called Ohio the, the upcountry was mm -hmm. the term they used, which I think is a great term. Um, so, uh, and the cargo on these flatboats were basically the, the short answer anything that salt. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, in terms of Lincoln's cargo, there are a couple of clues that the, uh, the old timers who were interviewed by Billy Herndon in, in 1865 and afterwards, which was a rich data source here, not Herndon's book per se, but his notes uh, of the interviews. Um, the most likely cargo was the, 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 the Western Standard hominy corn and smoked hog meat. After that, some of the manifests, you'll see everything from uh, staves to uh, biscuit, which is pottery, to squash, to um, just a full, uh, sometimes live, uh, you know, livestock and chickens, anything that's all. You do say that, of course, we'll, we'll talk about this a little later on, about the uh, sugar uh, coast plantations right, yes. above New Orleans, right. uh, Natchez, that area, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, where a huge number of slaves were, uh, and Lincoln will talk about that too, what he saw there. Uh, but uh, so you say how many of them were coming with specific feed for the That's slaves right. from the north. And this, this was called barrel pork. pork. Uh, so it was the, um, the, the fatty, lower quality, uh, high, high protein parts of the pig uh, that were packaged in barrels in kind of a, a, like a salty water and brought down and exchanged uh, in the southern plantation country, usually to feed uh, uh, the slaves. And oftentimes, um, when the flatboatmen came down, once they hit, hit the sugar coast, and this was that basically where the Delta Egg Plain begins, just south of Baton Rouge, this aligns almost perfectly with the cotton sugar line. So uh, cotton plantations would be in the lower alluvial valley, Natchez, Vicksburg, that area. Once you get past Baton Rouge, it's, it's, cotton also grows there, but sugar better grows there. And so, so they call this area the sugar coast, and what they would do oftentimes, Lincoln called it lingering, they would go from plantation to plantation. Each plantation would have a dock and right up to the river where they interacted with the rest of the world. And oftentimes trade or sell their upcountry goods with the plantations for sugar or cotton, then bring those to New Orleans because they were always assured a market for sugar and cotton, mm -hmm. and then take a steamboat back. Now, you spoke briefly about the impediments. What impediments would a flatboatman especially, you saw the sandbars were one, mm -hmm. what else would be an impediment to them? Planters and sawyers uh, were feared. And what this was, a planter uh, uh, was a, the term for an uprooted mature tree floating in the river just below the surface. So you could imagine uh, the root system weighted with rocks and things pointing down. And it would just, now if your flatboat had hit that, it could rip a hole in it. So there was a Titanic on the Exactly, exactly. These would be the icebergs. Mm -hmm. uh, and a sawyer would be the same thing bobbing up and down like a saw. Mm -hmm. And that, that could, there were also, um, you know what a wind shear is and how pilots fear wind shears, mm -hmm. these errant kind of jet streams. Well, the Mississippi River has that as well. And these are uh, not fully understood, but uh, if you were on the steering oar and you hit one of these shears, these kind of 
uh, sharp edges in two different currents. It could wrench you and, and toss you into the river. By one account in the 1820s, I believe it was, flat bone, one flat bowman reported seeing at least one dead body, a drowned body per day. That's how dangerous it was. Well, you talk, interestingly, how the, in the 1828 trip, how, uh, how difficult it was to get into the Mississippi because of the currents as well. Was there a, a modern understanding of the science of river systems at the time that Lincoln and his people did not know then? Uh, I would call it more folk knowledge uh, mm -hmm. in that there was, there was a, a river culture developing. And one of the fascinating cultural roles that this flatboat economy played was that a young man taking a flatboat down to New Orleans was seen as a rite of passage. Yeah. And they, they, they tested, it was a test of a young man to see if he had the wherewithal, the ingenuity to, to solve these very river problems and to come home with cash and, and do good for his family. And once you came home, you were viewed in a different way. You, you had proven your manhood. Probably to yourself as well. Yeah. That's Lincoln right. certainly is you're, you're saying right. throughout this book right. how he gained a confidence mm -hmm. in there and showed that he had responsibility right. exactly. and understanding and how to step up to the plate mm -hmm. as it were mm -hmm. uh, as well. You go a bit into uh, what, what velocity did About, they go? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I want to design to be that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to back up a little bit in the um, the 1828 voyage. Um, those of you who are familiar with the literature. Some say springtime, and some say uh, very early winter, like uh, just before Christmas were the two departure dates. And I really endeavored to nail down what that exact departure date was, because once you calculate that, then that opens up the window of time in which you could reconstruct street life at the pedestrian level in New Orleans to which Lincoln would have been exposed. So, uh, and I, I go, it's very, there's a long section where um, I, I go through that and look at all the evidence and by literally a five to one ratio, because I put numbers on this, I could say with, with that level of confidence that they left in the second week of April in 1828. So um, now once, once you get that, what time does he land in the city? That's where the velocity question is. Mm -hmm. Turns out 1828 was a remarkably high water year. People talked about it for decades afterwards. Flatboatmen loved high water because higher velocities, 5.5 miles per hour is what I ended up calculating. Mm -hmm. uh, they also loved high water because that got you above the sandbars. Mm -hmm. So uh, that and other evidence of, of uh, looking at uh, flatboat arrivals in New Orleans, and that's where my New Orleans geographer uh, set of um, data sets come into handy, that I was able to go through the records and look at flatboat arrivals. And guess what? If you left in early April, you would have arrived around mid-May. There's all sorts of flatboats arriving in mid-May. If you left in December, you would have arrived in January. People did leave, in, as unbelievable as that sounds, they did leave in the dead of winter. What arrived in January of early 1829? Almost zero. So that lends a lot of evidence to the, the April 1828. Well, you also have some other uh, evidence from sources mm -hmm. that Herndon, Billy Herndon, right. his uh, law partner, uh, said. I want to ask you about sources. As a dealer in relics, um, I can say that no one fashioned Lincoln relics better than Lincoln's cousin, Hanks. John Hanks. And he, you know, if there's a relic that has John Hanks in the provenance, I take two giant steps backwards <laughs> in a large breath, and uh, and usually I've pass on. I've come to love the guy. So, might this also have been true of his recollections yes. of Lincoln that Herndon got mm -hmm. that were embellished for one reason or another? Yes. Uh, so, how how do you rate the personal sources, and how do you rate? Yeah, them? that's a that's another great question. Uh, Hanks. Um, uh, by the way, the, on the the uh, the author photo, that's on the inside flap there. That's I'm at look the John same, Hanks' except grave. With the hat. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm at John Hanks' grave there. He's in. Uh, in he's a uh, very colorful cat. Now this is Lincoln's distant cousin, uh, and uh, born in I believe 1802, <coughs> and uh, a very colorful character. Uh, he introduces as many problems to this whole narrative. Uh, as he solves. Uh, and one of the biggest ones is a quote that you're probably familiar with, and it goes like this. 
uh, that uh, Hanks was, was with Lincoln. Now, this would have been the 1831 journey. And he describes Lincoln as coming away from a slave auction saying, if outraged at what he saw, and he says, if I ever get a chance to hit, it, hit that thing, slavery, I'll hit it hard. And I, in the conclusions chapter, uh, I've, I've kind of pieced together a history of that infamous quote. And the reason why I say it's infamous is that Lincoln himself took pains to, he went out of his way, even in that very brief Scripps uh, autobiography, to point out that Hanks didn't make it all the way down to New Orleans with him. He actually disembarked in St. Louis and went back. And so this, once that came to the realization of historians, it kind of contaminated the, the whole significance of the New Orleans journeys. And so I think it's important to put that in context. That said, there's another very compelling piece of evidence from a letter that Lincoln wrote to Alexander Hamilton Stevens, this is the future president, vice president of the Confederacy, where Lincoln spells out explicitly that what he saw in New Orleans in terms of slave and slave tracing, uh, trading exceeded anything that he saw in Kentucky and that it made a great impression on them. There's a number of other evidences. So to, to go back and address the Hanks problem, uh, that I, I make a distinction in the book between precision and accuracy. Um, they're not synonymous. Uh, what Hanks said might well have been construed, it might have been based on later conversations, it was imprecise. Was it inaccurate? I would say, in fact, it was accurate. Uh, so, uh, you know, one has to handle Hanks with care uh, and other kind of vernacular sources, but, but I would point out that we should, I think historians should think twice before dismissing folk knowledge, and that much could be learned from folk knowledge, uh, although it must be handled with care. Hmm. Well, um, you handled with care. Have you gotten, by the way, any feedback from Lincoln historians on your methodology or on your sources or on the book itself? Uh, not not yet. I mean, every now and then mm -hmm. I, I get emails, but mm -hmm. um, I'm, yeah, I'm well, it's just out. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it should do well. I think this is a fascinating book and one that should be on anyone's Lincoln shelf, frankly, because it really deals with what the man was early on. Uh, and what he saw, and how what he saw impacted him. Now at this point, that's the way it was going. He wasn't yet impacting anyone else except for people around him who uh, saw the responsibility that he could take. We talked about that a bit ago, and therefore he was elected captain uh, in the Black Hawk right. War a year later. Now, in 1828, not that he had not seen slavery before. That's right. He, born certainly, in Kentucky. And, right. and he, he was born in Kentucky, so he was quite young, and certainly uh, I believe that Thomas Lincoln uh, had something to do with his feelings against slavery and the, as an institution. Um, but in 1828, he starts out his trips, the first time he goes to New, or to New Salem, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, gets on that sandbar there and can't get off, and that's what leads to the patent. But then he gets off and goes on. Uh, that's 1831. In, oh, I'm sorry, that's right. I'm, I'm going forward. I'm sorry. They have two of them here. In 1828, though, when he went down, he, he had on one side of him slavery, and the other side of him free that's territory. Right. That's right. Going down the Ohio, the Ohio River. Ohio River. Right. And then Mississippi turns right into everything mm -hmm. is slavery. Mm -hmm. And he gets into the Sugar Coast. Uh, and certainly there he was exposed to a great number of uh, blacks who were enslaved and others as well. 